hit the camera again and look at our next chapter, chapter 5 in our book study this summer, Reality Check Priest. So uh, in the section we've been looking at, Pastor Espinoza has been talking about the different aspects of our Christian identity, beginning first with what it means to be a Christian. Then last week we looked at what it meant to be a disciple. And remember, it's that lifelong instruction that begins with a call from Jesus. It's a whole way of life. And it doesn't have as much to do with filling your mind with knowledge as it does following a teacher. And of course, when it comes to being a Christian disciple, our teacher is Jesus Christ, our dear Lord. Right. Well, now we're going to look at another aspect of our Christian identity, and that is priesthood. To be a priest. So, first, kind of like I did with disciple, we'll just look at the use of that word priest in the Old Testament, but then also in the Greek usage. So, first of all, in the Old Testament, we have a very important phrase here in, uh, well, well, sentence, declaration, here in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Would somebody please like to read for us Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. All right, thank you. So God speaking to Moses says that he shall speak these words to Israel, to the whole nation, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. But as you may know, not all Israelites were called to be priests. Who were called to be the priests of Israel? The Levites. But we can even get more specific than that. The Levites were called to minister in the temple. But then you get to the sons of Aaron who were called to be the priests themselves. So uh, let's look at that just briefly. We'll look at a couple passages. Exodus 28, verse 1. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. So, so though all Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests to the Lord, that priesthood was ex exercised by a, by a particular tribe, and even more narrowly than that, by a particular house within that tribe, the house of Aaron. And in fact, it was restricted only to the house of Aaron. Uh, another couple passages we can look at. Exodus 40, um, 14 and 15. You shall bring the sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father. So here we see that the line continues, that after Aaron, his sons are to continue in this priesthood, um, and their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This is something that is to remain in effect throughout the ages. Um, and then here, one more passage, uh, Leviticus 6.16. 6, uh, I must have written that down wrong. All right, bear with me a second. All right, I don't know why it didn't come up. All right, anyways. Yes? Oh, actually, that's Hebrew. Actually, it's backwards. <laughs> this and, it looks right, and it looks right to me. Yeah. So, so no. <laughs> So, no, that's okay. Um, so you may know that the original language of the Old Testament was Hebrew, and the original language of the New Testament is Greek. Um, and Hebrew is, at least from our perspective, written backwards. So you actually would start here and move right to left, which is why it looks to be a little mixed up. <laughs> Some would say even if you know Hebrew, it's still a little mixed up. But... <laughs> Yeah. So in any case, yeah, that, that's where it needs to be. But, okay. Finally, uh, Leviticus 6.16, and the rest of it, Aaron and his son shall eat 
It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting they shall eat it. And so Aaron and his sons are the only ones who are permitted to eat this. It's restricted to them. And so we see the priesthood is restricted to this particular household. All right. Now, for those of you who were in lifelike this past spring, we studied the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is a very important book of the New Testament because it explains very clearly how the priesthood is fulfilled in Jesus. Now, for those of you who are in life light or maybe have studied Hebrews elsewhere, you may remember there's one really big hurdle to Jesus being a priest. And what is that hurdle? He's not a Levite. Right, exactly. What tribe did Jesus come from? Judah. Judah. From the tribe of Judah. Judah was not the tribe of priests. Jesus came from the line of Judah, and therefore, by birth, he was disqualified from being a priest. And yet we know that part of his office as the Messiah was to be our priest. So how could he be a priest for us if he didn't come from the priestly line of, well, Aaron, let alone the Levites? He's of the order of Melchizedek. Right. So we're going to look at the, a few of these passages that are so important for us. Uh, first, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Um, so here's a little bit of information about what the priest does and how Jesus fulfilled it. Would somebody just like to read this first paragraph? 5, 1 through 4. Christianity 
is superior to Judaism because it's the fulfillment of everything that was foreshadowed and foretold in Judaism. Uh, the, the, the thought is that Hebrews was written at a time when Christians were beginning to be persecuted for their faith in Jesus. And so there was a temptation among the Jewish Christians to reject Jesus and go back to the synagogues and their former ways of life. Because Judaism was a protected religion under Roman law. So they could still believe in God the Father, so they thought, and just give up Jesus, and then they wouldn't have to deal with persecution. So the author of Hebrews is writing to them saying, no, you can't do that. Everything in the Old Testament was leading to Christ, including the priesthood. And here's one of the key differences. Um, what's, what's the difference between the Levitical priesthood and Jesus' priesthood, according to verses 23 through 25? Jesus didn't have any sin, so he didn't have to sacrifice himself. Well, that's coming up, and that is one of the key differences. You're right. So, you're absolutely right. But in this passage, there this paragraph many, we saw... There were many priests because yeah. they died, yeah. whereas Jesus is the one priest who lives forever. Right, right. There's only one priest, and that's Jesus. All the other priests... Had to uh, all the other priests died, and so there are multiple priests. But Jesus continues forever. Now, uh, Ted, I think it's this next passage that you were speaking to. So, uh, if you'd like to read it, you may, or if somebody else would like to, twenty-six through twenty-eight. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all, when he offered himself up. For, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. The word of the oath, which came later than the law, appointed the son, who has been made perfect forever. All right, thank you. And yes, this is what you were saying, that Jesus has no need to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own and then for this, those of the people, because he has no sins. So he had no need to offer sacrifice for himself. Instead, he offered himself once for all. And uh, the author of Hebrews makes that point also. Again, I'm not sure if we're looking at that passage or not, but uh, that... Jesus' sacrifice was not offered daily, uh, because daily sacrifices by their own um, daily offering indicate that they're insufficient. Uh, okay, uh, here's another uh, wonderful passage about this. Uh, let's have somebody read 1 through 4. Now the point in what we are saying is this. Such a high priest, the one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. All right. Thank you. So another difference between the Levitical priests and Jesus is that the Levitical priests offered sacrifices in an earthly tabernacle. And they had to have something to offer. They couldn't offer themselves. They offered the blood of bulls and goats. Jesus is a minister in the holy places, the heavenly tabernacle that the Lord has set up, not man. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Um, and then 5 through 7, if somebody would like to read that. Very important point in the book of Hebrews. 
that if the first covenant was sufficient, if it accomplished what it was set out to do, then there would be no need for a second covenant, a new covenant or a new testament, uh, which we ourselves heard just moments ago, or we will hear in a little while. A new testament in my blood. Um, then I think we'll turn to Hebrews 10. I don't think we'll read the whole section, but uh, just to wrap up this whole matter of Jesus being our priest. Um, here, let's, uh, let's go to verse 5 through 7. Would somebody like to read that for us? Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. All right, thank you. And then finally to um, wrap this section up, verses 8 through 10. When you said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to you to do your will, and he does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. All right, thank you. So, so finally, and then there's far more we could read and, and study here in Hebrews about the priesthood of Christ. But, but I want to look at this and then use this as some kind of our springboard to talking about Christians being priests. Uh, that Jesus was off, Jesus offered not a bull, not a goat, not a ram. He offered himself. The sacrifice he offered as our great high priest was himself. When he gave his body and shed his blood on the cross uh, as that perfect once and for all final offering for our sins. And that sets the pattern for our own Christian priesthood. That as Christian priests, we are called to offer sacrifices too. But the sacrifices that we offer are not the uh, offerings of bulls and goats. That would be uh, an offense, given that Jesus offering uh, Jesus offered himself once and for all. Likewise, as Christian priests, the offerings we give are not offerings for sin, because Jesus, by his death, paid for our sins once and for all. So rather than offering ourselves, excuse me, rather than offering bulls and goats, we offer ourselves. So let's take a look at what it means to be a priest as a Christian. Romans 12. All right, would somebody like to read 12, 1, uh, verse 1? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, fully acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay, so as priests, we offer sacrifices. But they are not the sacrifices of animals, but rather the sacrifices of ourselves. Again, just as Christ offered himself once for all, we as his people, as Christians, are called to offer ourselves likewise. But again, we are not called to offer ourselves in order to win forgiveness of sins. We are not called to offer ourselves to atone for transgressions. So why do we offer ourselves? We're going to go back to Hebrews one more time. Um, and then 15 and 16. Themselves as 
sacrifices of what? Sacrifices that are pleasing to God, but uh, in the verse before that, sacrifices of what? Praise, right. Praise and thanksgiving. That the sacrifice of ourselves that we offer as Christian priests does not earn the forgiveness of sins. That's been earned once and for all by Jesus and his offering of his body on the cross. But rather it's response to that forgiveness. It's, uh, it's, it's the praise that comes in reaction to it. Yes? Why is that considered a sacrifice? <laughs> because it's offered to God. Okay. Just... So... So maybe let's let's take it back a little bit, and, and maybe it'll be a little bit more clarified. Going back to what do, what's the question? Uh, why is praise and thanksgiving considered to be a sacrifice? Oh, okay. So, so let's go back to the beginning, to Exodus, when God tells Moses what the priests are to do, and the priests are to act as mediators of a sort between God and man. So the priest represents man to God, and how did the priest represent man to God? Through burnt offerings, mainly. Through the burnt offerings, but also in another way. Through prayer and worship, exactly. The priest offered prayers on behalf of the people, and the priest offered the sacrifices and burnt offerings on behalf of the people to God. But there's another direction. How did the priest act, um, or should, let me rephrase it, how did the priest present God to the people? It was in the Holy of Holies. Yeah, in the Holy of Holies, and what did the priest do? <laughs> From God to the people. Splash them with blood. Right. Exactly. He anointed them with the blood. He preached the word of God to them. He testified to God's favor. He instructed the people. So from God to man, there's instruction. There's teaching. Now Jesus. So, so we already looked at the Levitical priests. How did Jesus mediate between man and God? What did he do toward God on behalf of man? Yeah, he offered himself as that perfect once and for all sacrifice to God. Now, how did also he represent God to men? He became one of us. Right, exactly. Like, well, like we heard in our gospel lesson, he preached the word. He became man for us men and for our salvation. Still today, he mediates between God and men, right? He gives us his word and sacrament. He declares us to be forgiven. He is our intercessor. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Um, like Hebrews says elsewhere, that's why we can draw near with confidence to his throne of grace. Well, now let's consider us Christians. How do we represent mankind to God as Christians? Through prayer. Exactly. Let's take a look at this passage here. Um, First Timothy 2. Um, uh, let's go 1 through 4. Would somebody like to read that?
that we offer supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all, but especially for our rulers. Uh, when we pray, we are acting as priests. We are representing the people before the Lord. And in fact, the Lord hears those prayers and is moved to act on account of those prayers. It's one of those mysterious um, uh, aspects to prayer, that God is moved to action because of the prayers of his people. Our, our Lutheran forefathers taught that the world is preserved because of the prayers of the church. Uh, that, that God preserves his world because of the prayers you offer. Now again, that's a mystery because we also think about God's perfect will and how his will can be affected by our prayers. Uh, but however the mystery works, we leave it to God. We do, know, we do know that God wants us to pray, that God commands us to pray, and that God hears those prayers and he acts because of those prayers. And so, as priests, we intercede for people. We uh, pray to God on behalf of people. We mediate, so to speak, between people and God. But, and this is key, our office as priests can never be divorced from he who is the great high priest, Jesus. For immediately after saying, we should offer supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving, Paul says there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yeah? That's where I get confused because it says, he desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. A couple weeks ago we were talking about the chosen people. Me, that still means everybody's chosen, that other people just don't choose to go the right way. So this is the great mystery of election, which is sometimes called the cross of the theologian, because when it comes to the matter of election, that is, being elect to salvation, we can only confess what the Bible teaches and no more. And we get into great danger when we start to confess more than the Bible teaches. So... For example, uh, we have verse 4, like you said. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But we also know not all people are saved. Not all people come to the knowledge of the truth. So that, that brings in another wrinkle to this whole matter. How is it that God could want all people to be saved, and yet at the same time not everybody is saved? Well, some say... God doesn't really want all people to be saved. That would be the more Reformed or Calvinist answer, which talks about double predestination. God elects some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. So you, you, den you deny this. Other people say, okay, God wants all people to be saved, but not everybody's saved. Therefore, you must do something to be saved. Something in you, something done by you, some work or effort or intention then seals the deal. Uh, and that can be everything from you know, the, the non-denominational Baptist types who say, you got to make your decision for Jesus if you want to be saved. you got to decide to follow him. To the Roman Catholics who say, you have to do these works. Your faith has to be completed in love. Or some people just deny that. People go to hell. That's universalism, right? Well, God wants everyone to be saved, so hell must not be real. Hell must be a figure. Well, against all of those false teachings, we Lutherans have to just stand on the word of God, even if it seems to contradict in our own minds. God wants all people to be saved. Not everybody's saved. We can't do anything to earn our salvation. How does that work? We leave it to God. What do we know? We know that we are saved not by our own works or efforts, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus offered himself once and for all, like we saw in Hebrews, and all means all. Uh, we know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so, finally, when it comes to the matter of election, we leave that to God, and we cling to what he has spoken clearly in his word. That is, Jesus loves all people. That he wants all to be saved. That Jesus died for all people. And whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Yes? Okay. <laughs> this is good to you. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we kind of took the left turn here, yeah, but that's okay. The question on this is, we were taught that God, or Christ, brings into your heart belief and faith. Mm -hmm. Through the Word. So, we're supposedly in this room brought to belief and faith. Yes. But the guy across the road, God decides not to give him that. No, see, that's that would be going too far to say God decides not to give somebody faith. Because, again, God wants all people to be saved. So, so this idea that God chooses some to have faith and he rejects others is false. God wants all people to be saved. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the payment for the sins of the whole world. And by that, we can go up to... And I think uh, Pastor Espinosa speaks about this a little bit in his book. But we can go up to any sinner on the street, no matter who he is, no matter what he's done, and we can say, Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. Repent, believe the gospel, and you will have eternal life. We can go up to the, the worst Hitler or Bin Laden and say that, and not have any doubt that Jesus died for that person's sins too. So that rejection of Christ is by choice of that individual choosing not to believe? <laughs> to a certain extent, yes. Although remember that we are all predisposed to that choice because of original sin. I think we talked about this last week, maybe it was a couple, I forget. I think we talked about this, though. That on account of, yeah, it was last week. On account of original sin, we are all dead in our trespasses. And so by default, we would all reject God. We would all reject His Word. It's only the Holy Spirit working through the Word to change our heart, to give us a new heart, that we would believe in Him. But didn't the Holy Spirit yeah, yeah, it, that's a that's a very good point. And our well, our book of Concord talks about that. Um, and actually, just uh, an advertisement. This year, we're going to be reading the article about election in Formula Eleven. Uh, so, if you want to learn more about this, come to our Bible study on Wednesday night, starting in September. But it speaks about that very matter, and uh, and it says that. Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then finally God gave him over to that hardness. That Moses came and he preached to Pharaoh, Aaron did his signs in Pharaoh's sight, and Pharaoh rejected, Pharaoh refused, over and over and over again. And finally God said, have it your way. And in many ways, and the book of Revelation has that sort of a phrase also, and in many ways that's the scariest thing you can imagine, is when God just says, okay, you want it? Have when God finally says, let the sinner continue in his way. But yeah, Pharaoh began by rejecting the word that was preached, the signs that were done, and finally God turned him over to that rejection, which he himself, God didn't decide, no, you can't believe in me. Pharaoh rejected, and finally God said, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think we looked at this also. If we go back to um, our, our small catechism, the third article of the Creed, uh, the explanation begins, I cannot, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. Uh, that teaches, and again it's drawn right from the Bible, that there isn't even a little opening. There's not even a little spark. Again, we have the example of Lazarus, who was dead as a doornail. There wasn't even a spark of life in him to hear the word of God. He was expired, and, and four days such. But the powerful, life-giving word of God came to that dead man and enlivened him. And so also we, we read this in Ephesians last week, we who were dead in our trespasses, not mostly dead, not kind of dead, but dead dead. We were made alive together with Christ through the Word. So, so there's no spark, there's no little opening, there's not even a tiny measure of free will when it comes to our salvation. We're just all dead. If we're all dead,
This is, and this is the, the danger of trying to dig too deeply into this mystery. So again, we have to stick with what is clearly said in Scripture, and that is that we are dead in our trespasses, made alive by God through His Word. Uh, we know that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We know that sinners can reject God's Word, and even reject God's Word to the point of condemnation. Now, we would never say the Holy Spirit chooses somebody to be saved, but then decides not to save another person. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking, because I think of my brother. My brother, yeah. he, he is, he, you know, he, he just did not believe in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He called the Bible stories, and now he just, Yeah. he's like, you know, Right. But, you know, yeah. And we can say, on the foundation of God's Word, that there was nothing in him um, to deserve that. There was nothing in him that made God choose him. Uh, there was nothing in him that affected that change. But only the word of God working, sometimes overtly, sometimes subtly, sometimes perhaps through you, you and your witness. But the Holy Spirit was working. And according to God's perfect timing, he broke that heart of stone and turned it into a heart of flesh, to use the words of Ezekiel. Um, but, but even still, we can, and uh, I'll just leave it at that, we can resist the work of the Holy Spirit. The dead man can stay dead when he pushes back, so to speak. And, and this is something else, I mean, not to go on too far of a tangent, I see we're almost done, um, but, you know, a lot of times as Lutherans, who, who so focus on this idea that we are saved by grace alone apart from our works, which is absolutely right. Uh, we, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking, well, that means that God drags me into heaven kicking and screaming, pushing back the entire time. But that's not true. Our Book of Concord, quoting one of the early church fathers, Augustine, says, God makes unwilling people into a willing people. We don't use the term very often anymore, but our Lutheran forefathers used to constantly speak about conversion. That there is a real change that takes place in the heart of the sinner when he hears the gospel and believes it. So that he who once resisted God, now even accepts God. Again, we don't like to use that word either because of how it's been misunderstood by our non-denominational friends. But, but there is a sense in which the Christian whose heart has been changed by the Holy Spirit now accepts God and wants to follow God. Again, God doesn't drag people into heaven kicking and screaming. What he does is he takes the kicking and screaming person and changes him to be a willing person. Now you still have the old Adam, of course, that sinful nature who's still kicking and screaming. But as we saw last week, that doesn't define you. Because you are a new man created in Christ Jesus for good works. Who loves God's law and wants to do as well. You know, so take something like coming to church. There are times when we don't feel like going to church, right? But none of us are, I don't know how you might say this, possessed by the Holy Spirit and like robots forced to go into church. Somehow, even if you're tired or you got a lot on your to-do list, somehow you say, all right, I'm going to go to church because it's good for me or because I, I know I should be there or sometimes because I want to be there. And that is all indicative of the Holy Spirit working in you, even with some pushback by the old Adam. But the fact that you want to go to church indicates that the Holy Spirit's there in your heart, working in you, changing you. So... That was kind of a long tangential answer, but, but the point is, there, there's nothing in us worthy of salvation, and there's nothing in us that causes our salvation. But when the Holy Spirit comes to us and gives us faith, all of a sudden now he creates in us that new man that says, Ah, I love God. I want to do what he says. And so now no longer it's, is that conflict taking place between man and God. Now the conflict's more internalized between the old Adam and the new man. But still, as Christians, we're, we're going to follow God. We're going to want to do what he says, although in weakness. All right. Other questions? Well, we, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about priesthood. <laughs> or 
or well, we did, but not about how we Christians are priests, but that's okay, because um, we had some good conversation. But to, to conclude, as Christians, we represent man to God through our prayers. But how is it that we represent God to, to man? How is it that we show God to the people? And Pastor Espinosa discusses this uh, in this chapter extensively. I, I heard... Well, first, uh, well, maybe I'll say second, uh, through our example of good works. Um, that's what Jesus says to the disciples in John 13. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. We share the scriptures. We share yes, the scriptures. oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, so by word, first and foremost. But second, and very important, is by deed. Um, this is what Jesus says, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But along with that comes the confession, the testimony, sometimes called a witness. We kind of use those terms interchangeably. But the idea that we speak to God, or excuse me, we speak to men on behalf of God. And that's not just a pastor thing. I wish we had more time to get into this. Uh, that the pastor is called to preach and teach publicly in the name of a congregation. And kind of like the Levites of old, he's the only one who should be preaching publicly and administering the sacrament. But that doesn't mean that the pastors are the only ones who should teach the word of God. Every Christian should teach the Word of God in those places to which you've been called, your households, your neighborhoods, your family, maybe even in your workplace if God grants an opportunity. But every Christian should be not just comfortable, but ready to teach his neighbor about Jesus. Um, and then to wrap up, this is a passage that Pastor Espinoza looks at extensively. Uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, let's read uh, verses, well, let's just read verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yeah, do it in gentleness and with respect. All right. So Peter is writing to Christians here. And he says that we should always be prepared to make a defense to anyone. And yet do so with gentleness and respect. So, so to wrap up, how is it that you will be prepared to make a defense? How do you get prepared, so to speak? By studying the Word. By being in the Word of God. Exactly. So... So if we are going to be prepared to make a defense, we have to have our defense at the ready. And that comes through study of the Word of God and through prayer. All right. We're about out of time. Any last comments or questions before we conclude? All right. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.